This episode of Pick Up the Six podcast is brought to you by Every Man Jack. If you haven't heard of them, they're a men's grooming company that creates some of the highest performing, best smelling products on the market. They believe it's not just about what you put in your body that matters, but what you put on your body from their body wash to deodorant to beard oil and more. They're made with naturally derived ingredients and incredibly outdoorsy scents that bring the best of nature to their bottles and bars. I'm a huge fan of all their stuff. The sandalwood scent, probably my favorite of all the things they have. And it's literally in my shower right now. So here's what you do. Head to everymanjack.com today and use our special promo code PUT6, PUT and the number six for 25% off on orders of 50 bucks or more. Making small changes to your routine, even in the shower, can have a significant impact. And Everyman Jack makes that easy. Everyman Jack, naturally derived, outdoor inspired. We're also sponsored by Amino Vitals. Amino Vitals' mission is to provide the highest quality of amino acid based nutritional products to all athletes aspiring to improve their conditioning and performance. The BCAAs, Glutamine and arginine help replenish the body's muscle proteins and jumpstart the recovery process. I've been using Amino Vital since last fall, got introduced to them, and I see a positive impact from their action and recovery products. It helps me just get rid of some of those you know, aches and pains that come with a tough workout. Hit up amino-vital.com, use the code PUT6 at checkout and save 20% or just click on their link on the show page and save today. Six months after welcoming their second son to their now growing family, Lisa and Glenn Moore just felt like something was off. Glenn was facing multiple deployments and Lisa knew they had to take action quickly to help their baby, Hunter. That's where their journey with cerebral palsy started. But it sure doesn't end there. Now 15, Hunter is an absolute inspiration. He's an award-winning bodybuilder and starting long snapper on his JV football team. I can't wait for you to meet the Moore family on this episode of Pick Up the Six Podcast. Hey guys, Brian Jodis back once again for another episode of Pick Up the Six Podcast. Absolutely thrilled to have members of the Moore family with me. But before we introduce them, just another shout out and thanks to those sponsors, we're just so grateful for their partnership here at Pick Up the Six Podcast to help put a little wind in the sails of this pirate ship. And of course, my man at One Nation Coffee, John Richards and those guys with that stack of coffee over my shoulder there, they, they're keeping us well caffeinated and we're so grateful for them. Use the code PUT6 at One Nation Coffee. You can save 15% off. Veteran owned, first responder owned, great company pouring back in to the community. So thankful for them as well. And we've got a military man and his family. On the podcast today, it's Colonel Glenn Moore. We've got a son, Hunter, and wife, Lisa, and they're checking in from Bernie, Texas. So we're going, man, my, the first job I had out of college was in the great state of Texas in Wichita Falls. It's where those horns came from. And so we check in from Bernie, Texas, and the Moore family. What's up? How you doing this evening? Doing great, sir. How you doing? All right. We can knock all of that off right there, sir. I'll send it your direction. It does not need <laughs> to come back my way, okay? Well, I know it's a form of habit, though, and I love you for it. It's great. It's hard to break those habits, isn't it? It's a hard habit to break. (laughs) It's not just from the military. It's called being from Texas. Being being from Texas, being respectful. One of the greatest things about the great state of Texas, there's so many good things. I met my wife there. She's from Philadelphia. I had gone out there for work. It's kind of crazy how we met. So great, fond memories. Y'all don't know about how people pass on highways in Texas. They pull over. They get out of the way so you can pass them. It's the greatest. It's the greatest. Well, that's not always true, but yes. Well, <laughs> a lot of times. Most of the people should, unless there's an yeah. armadillo in the way, which is more times than not. That's right. And lately, in the last few years, we've had a lot of people from out of state move into the state. Yeah. So yeah. That, that changes the dynamics be. of it all. Well, listen, you know my theory. If you're moving from wherever you came from, to the great bastion of freedom that is the great state of Texas, you might need to course correct a few things in your life. You might want to consider that. Just just one man's opinion from the outside yes, looking in. So yes, check sir. this out, guys. Here's here's how God is amazing. We know there's plenty of reasons and just how things are cool. I was on uh, Twitter a couple weeks ago, and I see a video of a son and his dad long snapping. 
And at first I sort of looked through it quickly, right? Looked pretty, you know, standard routine. And then I saw my friend Chris Rubio had liked the tweet and it was from Colonel Moore. And so I said, well, that's cool, man. Maybe Chris knows them. And then I, I examined the video more. So he's snapping one head. Okay. That's cool too. And then I read more and I start to read Hunter's story. And I read this family story about this young man who's had cerebral palsy for years and how he's battled through and continue to rise from every challenge and how he's playing high school football, snapping one handed and just pursuing his dreams and getting after it. And I was like, man, I got to talk to these guys. And so I hit Colonel Moore up on a DM and he said, Hey man, let's do it. And, uh, and we chatted uh, offline and then he's been traveling all over the place and I've been traveling. And so here we are uh, on an evening after the young man's had football practice today and all that. And so guys, I'm just, first and foremost, I'm just so grateful to have you tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And we really appreciate you doing this. We'd like to get Hunter's story out there. Absolutely. Well, that's what we're going to do. Uh, and Miss Lisa jumped on. So we got the whole crew here. It's great. It's rare that I get to do family interviews. So I'm kind of <laughs> thrilled. To be well, honest. like I told you in the text, it's a team effort here between the three of us. So actually it's a four person effort because he's got an older brother that's in college playing football. Oh, beautiful. Well, let's do this. I would love to hear just a few minutes about dad's military journey, because I know it's a big part of family life, right? But then we're going to get into Hunter's story. So, Colonel, do you mind just sharing a little bit about, you know, your time, what you've done? And I know you're still pretty active and busy. Well, I joined the uh, military back in 1990, served 28 years, five months, and 13 days on active duty. Not, not that, that anybody I, was keeping count of all those. Not days. that I was keeping count, but when you when you uh, do your final out and they hand you the DD-214, mm-hmm. you hear those words and you remember uh, that and you never forget. So I was a Chinook pilot by trade or a hooker as known by most. Uh, flew uh, all the way up to, I just made uh, the end of my Lieutenant Colonel years. And then I uh, got selected for Fort Polk, Louisiana to be the garrison commander there. While some people would, would say that's a, a bad thing. It was three of the best years of my life. I had really good command, uh, kind of command above me that really trusted me and from there, I went to Rhode Island to, uh, I got picked up for the Naval War College, stayed on at the Naval War College and um, taught there for two years and then decided to retire to give his older brother four years in uh, one high school. Mm. I felt it was very yeah. important yeah. to do that. Yeah, that's a big thing. You guys remember those Chinooks? We've talked about them uh, a few times on this podcast. Had Matt Brady on to talk about the Night Stalkers. And uh, what the Chinooks do, you talk about just a workhorse of a helicopter and what they're able to do from a transport and reconnaissance and all that kind of stuff, especially when they're downrange. It's a it's a hell of an aircraft. And I'm sure one that you spent a lot of time in and still has a sweet spot in your heart. Like my dad spent a lot of time in the F-15, flew a lot of other planes. That's sort of his that's his plant. That's his jet. Right. He spent a lot of time in it. Chinooks yes, got to do the same for you. Right, sir. Yes, sir. It is. I, I tell you, and you mentioned the task force folks. Th- those are the real heroes of the mm-hmm. aviation community. They they were truly the workhorse. But uh, we could not have been as successful as we, we were, especially early on in Afghanistan and or the 22 days race for Baghdad, because we were pulling the long legs in Afghanistan, doing the high altitudes, pulling people out, bringing people in. So, yeah, it's, it's the workhorse. It's, it, you know, Huey was the workhorse of Vietnam and. Uh, the Chinooks, I feel strongly, were the workhorse of uh, Iraq and Afghanistan. Last one on that. You got to see it, right, coming in in 90, sort of both sides of the desert, right? Desert Storm in those early 90 days and then 9-11, right? And then sort of the effort after that. Right. Yeah. And, and I got because I went to flight school. That was a, a, a year. or Actually, they put us through uh, seven days a week once uh, Saddam invaded Kuwait. So it was really about 11 months that we were in flight school. So I didn't get there till the end of Desert Storm, and I got there for provide comfort, Operation Provide Comfort. So, and, and you're right, I got to see both sides. Yeah. Uh, special shout out to Lisa and the home crew, right? Having been on that side of military deployment, having watched my mom rush the three of us around to sporting events, right? Which way and the other. Uh, it is incredible. So Blue Star wife oh. and family, you know, kudos for sure. I do want to give her some kudos. She, uh, when I was, went to Afghanistan, I got pulled out of Command General Staff College and sent over and unknowingly got my wife pregnant uh, in the final days of departure. And uh, so she was pregnant with my oldest uh, for 
seven months of my Afghanistan time. I come home and get a call saying, uh, you're taking, you know, so a company commander of a Chinook company said, uh, you're going to be taking your company to Iraq for the invasion. So we wound up uh, working with the doctor and do some labor and uh, doing a C-section. So I could hold him for a couple of days and then hand wow. a screaming, upset baby to my wife while I went to Iraq for the invasion. And she she took care of business. Yeah, that's it takes a village, right? Um, and we just always had folks around us, too, that were there to help. Um, was that the same for you, Lisa? Well, luckily, this was in Savannah, Georgia. I'm a Georgia girl. Not that you can probably tell I'm from the South or anything, but um, go dogs. <laughs> yes, it beat my teeth. Well, there's a lot more to that story. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, I my hometown was about an hour and 20, 30 minutes so you, from Savannah. So yep. it was, it, it, if I could have been anywhere, that was the place mm -hmm. to be. Um, with my mother, I have a sister and family that lives in Savannah. So it was. The perfect place for me to be at that time. That's for sure. No coincidence. It was hard. Yeah, I no mean, coincidence. It, oh, yeah. I mean, it's not like I could just take him and hand him over. I mean, it was still, you yeah. know, all by myself pretty much. But, yeah. A lot of those yeah, overnight shifts. Yeah, a lot, of, a lot of those overnight shifts. Oh, yeah. So, but it, make it work. That's for sure. Well, she took over a family readiness group that was not the happiest as it was because we mm. were doing back-to-back -back deployments two months apart. Yeah. All right, so that's you got two sons, right? That's number one. There's yes, sir. I got Justin Moore, who's uh, currently at Hardin Simmons University playing football there. And Beautiful. My little hero here, Hunter sure. Moore, and I say little to see. Yeah, he's, he's getting big. He's getting big. <laughs> I know. I saw those bodybuilding pictures. We're going to talk about that. Um, what's the age difference between the two of those guys? Five years. Five years apart, right? So Hunter comes along. Uh, all right. So talk me through the journey of Hunter's birth, if you guys don't mind. Right. And then this cerebral pal palsy journey, right. How that, how you find that out, you know, what that's like from a parent perspective. And then Hunter, I want to ask you about it too. Right. But mom and dad, what's, what's that, what's that journey when that's laid at your feet, right. Can we go back and just talk about that a little bit? Sure. Yeah. Um, so Hunter was born in November. He was November 15th, 2007. Um, I was teaching at a Mother's Day Out program, and so I took that time off whenever he was born, and um, I stayed home with him for four months, and it was a very casual setting, so they had a, a nursery and that kind of thing, and I was only there two to three days a week, and so after he was four months old, we went back, um, so when he was first when I noticed something was not right. Um, we had invent and in, invention, um, I guess therapists that come in and just do, you know, routine checkups on the, sure. on the kids. And I had noticed that something just wasn't quite right with him because I would put him in this exorciser, which is what we called that then. I don't know what they call it now. Um, he had good head control and that kind of thing, but he would try to reach for things with his right hand, but his left arm just like it would just hang inside the exorciser. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I'd already had one child, so I kind of thought, well, that just doesn't seem quite right. You know, so I would pull his arm out, his left arm, try to get him to use it with his right hand, a bilateral kind of thing. And his left arm would just droop back into the exorciser. And after a couple of days, I, I was like, that that just doesn't seem right to me. So when the interventionists, that when they came in and they were doing their evaluations on all the kids, which is very typical, I asked them to please look at him. Tell me what you think. And so after they they did the initial evaluation, they said, we think that maybe we should do a more thorough evaluation. And so that's what they did. And they came, they come to the home, they do the evaluations, they do all these things to, to check and see if they're reaching milestones and that kind of thing. And um, so at that point, she told me that mm -hmm. she thought he needed to go to a neurologist, a pediatric neurologist. And we talked about how the brachial plexus, like 
in natural childbirth, that could possibly have been an issue, but he was C-section, so that could not have pertained to him. So at that point, we kind of knew that it had to be something neurological. And so that's what we did is we booked, made an appointment with the, a neurologist and it took quite a while to get in. Um, and by the time we got in and he had an MRI done, he was already eight months old. Hmm. And we just to tag on, we took him to a neurologist here in San Antonio because I was actually stationed at San Marcos at the time, uh, teaching at Texas state. Uh, but anyways, that neurologist could not figure out what the problem was. He just kept saying he had a vascular explosion. So we transferred him to Cook Children's uh, Hospital out of Fort Worth, Texas, greatest hospital I've ever been to in my life. And he had a phenomenal neurologist by the name of Dr. Acosta. And uh, he looked at the same MRI that the other doctor couldn't figure out and brought Lisa in and I in and said, your son has suffered a stroke. He suffered it sometime in utero and has severed the right peduncle as it goes into the brain stem. The right side controls the left side. And so he has no uh, real control. He's also suffering from dystonia, which is a secondary effect from it. Uh, it's non It will not get any worse, thank God. Not progressive. Not progressive. Mm -hmm. And um, anyways, you know, at that point, I'll be honest with you, I as a father, at least as a mother, we were crushed. You well, know. even before that, because the pediatric neurologist in San Antonio, Glenn was the PMS, Professor of Military Science at Texas State, and he they were at a summer camp during that time. And so I go in and I have him, and the first thing that came, that came out of his mouth was, you know, cerebral palsy. And I'm like, oh, my gosh. At that point, because I, I had been in the education field for, for quite a long time, I knew what my understanding of cerebral palsy was kids in wheelchairs, not walking, um, basically drooling on themselves. It, it was for me at that moment, it was very devastating. Mm. So, yeah, I can tell you, um, yeah, it was scary. And we were told at one point that we didn't know if he'd walk. We didn't know if he would really have a normal life. He wasn't verbal even as late as 28 months. Um, he, uh, wasn't walking. I, I carried him on my chest with a strap on, um, I forget what you call it. Anyways, it looks like kangaroo. <laughs> uh, anyways, um, but like, I guess it's normal for the first six months or so, the doctors were trying to find out what happened and they kept going on colleges and such. Lisa and I, I, at least I speak for me, and I think Lisa is saying, I felt guilt. I kept replaying every day of her pregnancy. What did we do wrong? We did something wrong, and we couldn't figure it out. The doctor speculates now that because he started out as twins, and one twin passed, that that mm. caused enough stress for him to, uh, to uh, suffer a stroke. Uh, but that was very early, so it's just yeah. very... I mean, like they said that it it was just a very freak kind of thing that yeah. is un un well, uh, I can tell you though we we both almost to the day said you know what enough's enough let's stop worrying about what we did because it's not about us let's stop trying to have the doctors poke and pry and try to figure out like I told Doctor Costa it is time to get him fixed. Let's get him the best quality of life that we can that he can attain, and let's move forward. And we never looked back. He's we've been very aggressive. He was getting up to 20, 25 Botox shots every three months up and down his left side with me holding him, or my best friend holding him if I was deployed. Um, he's had two restraint camps. He's had three surgeries. Um, but the biggest saving grace was um, the night. <laughs> Back up a little bit. The night before he was born, I remember the doctor had given me some paperwork about cord blood. And uh, I didn't know what cord blood was. And we'd seen about 20 uh, MRR sonograms. Um, he had a left hand, a right hand, had all the privates, had everything he needed. So I thought he was fine. But I just had a strange feeling. And I, you know, I won't get into religion, but if you're religious, somebody was talking to me. And they're like, look, I know you think you 
no, but I know better. So I called the core blood folks and just said, hey, um, tell me about this. They told me, and, and it was in California, and they said, you've got one hour to make a decision so we can overnight this kit to your doctor. So Lisa and I talked, I prayed, and I'm, you know, man enough to say that. And we uh, ordered it, put, you know, funny thing was, I said, I don't have $2,000 just to give out. I'm, I'm a military man. She said, oh, you're military, you get a 20% discount and you can use a credit card. And anyways, yeah. we, Ship banked, it. we banked this core blood. So now for 28 months or roughly wow. 26 months, we had you're, you're, say, you're, you're saying cord, right? C O R D, right? Umbilical yes. cord blood, right? Yes. Pure, strong. It's got all those nutrients, all that stuff in it that you need, right? Yes, it's yes. it's immature stem cells that yep. are not red, they're not white, and they go so because the of that. Because of that leap of faith, you're then able to use that in those early treatments. What I think is pivotal in your story, because then I want to talk to Hunter about this too, is that listen for a period of time, and I can understand. You're sort of doing this. What about why this? What right? You're living in this past of something that, quite frankly, you just we can't control it. It's here, right? It's here. And then you guys, as a family, made this intentional shift to, as you told me the other day, quote, to hell with that. Like, no, this will not define us, right? right. Even our, you know, you had nothing to this, nobody's fault, right? Even if we make mistakes earlier in our life, for all for far too many of us, we just let that define us. I just spent six hours mentoring men in a prison in Washington. These aren't apples to apples, but you get my drift, right? Those men have to move on from those mistakes to live the rest of their lives, right? To try to be better. And you guys in that moment had to make that switch. We've we've been saying it all along. We refuse to let cerebral palsy define him. That's right. He refuses more importantly. Clearly. Cerebral palsy. Clearly. Hunter, do you do you have a memory of an early age knowing this this was a thing that you had right knowing that you know what i got some differences from other folks do you, do, do you remember that or is you i guess when i started school and i realized other kids don't have the same thing as me yeah what was that like um confusing i guess like wondering why other kids don't have the same thing i did why i was different from other ones yeah that's a tough thing as a parent to send them off into that world even it is. Right. And there was times that, you know, he would get his Botox shots literally where I'm holding him, him screaming mm. and then him getting mad and screaming vocally that, you know, I, I hate God. Even why'd you give me this yeah. cerebral palsy? But that was when he was very young and he didn't understand. Sure. And uh, we've been, you know, ever since ever since he was young, we've been telling him, you can do whatever you want. Yeah, that's right. And then sports become a part of that. Right. So young man growing up, older brother playing football in Texas, like you're going to, you're living in Texas, right? You're going to want to, you're going to want to do those things. So how'd you not, how'd you not let that hold you back? Hunter, how'd you not let any of this hold you back? Um, I guess I have this saying that I like to say, prove them wrong. Mm -hmm. I think it started when my dad told me that the doctor said that I would never walk. So I took that into heart, proved the doctors wrong prove everyone that says that I can't do what they say I can't and just prove them wrong and do and do what I like to do. That's the old, that's the old watch, watch me. That's right. <laughs> that's the watch me mentality, right? Oh, you say I can't. All right. Well, I'm about to do it three, four times more than what you thought I could do, which is incredible. Lisa says as a mom, when sports come into play, right, there's got to be a little added nerves on your end. I don't know. What were your thoughts? Oh, yeah. <laughs> I'm nervous with the sports, regardless of the situation. But, um, yeah, I, I, it, it's added nerves because, you know, they will put him in for defensive positions. And at that moment, it's not that I don't think he can do it. It's, oh, my gosh, just please don't get hurt. You know, but even with – your kids that don't have any type of restraints or disabilities or anything, you always worry that something's going to happen and they're going to get hurt. But yeah, there is added, there is an added stressor to that for sure. All right. So you get to, to look at football, Hunter, what, what are you thinking about? All right, how can I play? What can I, what am I going to do? Right. Why um, the long snapping thing? Well, at first, when I first started playing football and or 
I did tackle football. I started playing in seventh grade. Our dog's trying to get me. It's all good. We've had family dogs make multiple appearances on podcasts. You got a beautiful golden retriever from what it looks like I saw in the yeah. snow, right? <laughs> if I saw, you can see. I saw the nose come in. <laughs> it's well, a we're, lot. we're trying to shove him. But anyways, go ahead. Who is it? What's that? What's that dog? Well, I'm gonna look, give me an introduction here. We might as well let the Hurry audience up. know who we got. Hurry up. What what's yeah, this dog's yeah. name? What do we got? What are we working with here? Name's Rodeo. He's a yellow lab. <laughs> Rodeo. Oh, wow. That's awesome. That's oh, awesome. Yeah. Yellow <laughs> lab. Tell him, tell him about how you got. Yeah. Tell me about that. Um, now well, that we've I mean, met the I, family dog. I started, I did flag football whenever I was younger and I would be the center. So I like, when you sit on your knee and you just snap yep. the ball. Yep. So yep. That's when I first started learning like what snapping is. And then whenever I went into seventh grade and we did school football, which was tackle, I didn't know there was a thing called long snapping. So I wanted to do receiver and cornerback. That didn't really work out that well. I mean, I played maybe some. And so they and can catch a ball with one hand. Though. I'm sure. Well. I'm sure. Very well. <laughs> Odell Beckham's got nothing on my guy over here. <laughs> but whenever I didn't really play much seventh grade year because of that, I wasn't really that good compared to the other kids in those positions. And then eighth grade came along and my dad mentioned something about me trying long snapping. And I was curious, and I wanted to try it, but the day football came along, kids were on the sideline telling me that it was 20 yards, it was 30 yards, this crazy amount, and I, I believed it because that's what everyone was saying. So I didn't try out because mm. I was scared that it was that far. He played football, but he didn't try it long. Sure, time. sure. But then I started watching videos next season, freshman year last year, and it was about maybe the summer before the season started. And I wanted to try it. So me and my dad every night started practicing just snapping on the football yeah. field. Well, listen, one of the greatest long snapping coaches on the planet is a heck of an American friend of mine, friend of yours, friend of what we're doing through NGBN. His name is Chris Rubio and he runs Rubio long snapping. And he's a, he, he went to, I, I snapped one handed. Right. That's right. And he went all the way to UCLA, right? Big time college football. Uh, so tell me how you get introduced to Chris. Cause I want to, he'll hate this Rubio. I don't care. Cause he's a <laughs> humble dude and he's not going to want us to talk about him, but tell me about meeting him. Cause I know you got to go to his camp. It's just, this is such a small world kind of deal. This doesn't happen on accident. Just to let, let lead him into this. Um, I went and talked to his head coach and I said, look, I want to teach my son how to, long snap we've been doing it and i think he's doing very well but i'd like to get him to that next level mm -hmm. and our head coach at bernie uh high school said the number one snapping coach in the united states if not the, you know the entire world is rubio long snapping so i did all my research but what really impressed me most and this is how great of american he is yeah i i text i i, I texted him because i got his number and just asked him a couple questions he called me and talked to me for nearly an hour about him. So good. And gave me all kinds of No uh, surprise. I'm gonna take I'm gonna take a picture of us recording right now so I can text him while we're on the air. This is actually <laughs> <a> real time. <laughs> so you tell him when we went to the camp, he God he treated Hunter Great Bay was cool. And when we went to the camp, the we were doing our warm ups and the first thing he said to me, he goes, Hey, are you Hunter? I'm excited to see you snap today. And he just, like, from there, he just was really nice to me at the camp yeah. and yeah. helped me a lot. He taught me, like, better form and stuff. Well, He's, off, he's great. First. He's great, right? This was just this past fall, right? This is very recently. Yes. He's great. He's great because he's super to the point, right? Very candid, but he's also, he'll hate this, but he's also just the kindest, kind heart, right, to be able to treat you that way. Most of, one great. of the most genuine men I've ever met in my life. Yeah, that's that's a great compliment. How was it hanging out with him, Hunter? And what was the rest of that camp like? It was fun. I it was the targets made me nervous, but other than that, I I liked it. I mean, it it was pretty fun. My freshman year playing organized football for the very first time, I was playing center, and I had played soccer and stuff growing up, but I always wanted to play football, right? So I got to high school, and finally, all right, it's my chance to play football and they're like this is a ragtag freshman football team i mean it was it was something 
And they're like, well, look, you're the center. You'll just, you'll just long snap. I'm like, this is ridiculous. And where do you <laughs> first game freshman football, full pads, first snap to the punter. I'll give you one guess where that snap went over his head. I'm flying, flying. <laughs> my whole family was there. My grandfather came up to I me. Mean, it was so embarrassing. <laughs> so embarrassing. So I'm sure you have better experiences than me because you're actually a, a master of your craft. And I was just a novice trying to make it work. Well, he does it every night. I mean, we, yeah. we Dedication. get out there and he works hard. All right. So that's amazing. Right. So now you're 15, right. You're into your sophomore year. Yes, right. But nothing's, nothing's given, man. Nothing's granted. So you've been going through the paces to get ready for the season. So catch us up, man. Where are we at right now? Um, We had our first game last week and we had I had I got two snaps that game. They were both good. The first snap was just for a normal extra PAT. Yep. And then the second snap was actually I got I was super nervous for it. I still made the snap, but it was right before halftime in the second quarter. The coaches were like, "Okay, PAT, get ready, get ready." With three seconds left on the clock, and I was like, "Whoa, are we going out there?" Did you guys and have to run it out like as time's going? We had to sprint. Oh, yeah. We had to sprint out there, get ready, get set, and snap it. Dad, do you and have like video of this? We well, this we have. It would do. My, we, do. we can get better video. Obviously, I got mom's iPhone working. He was in Germany or coming home from Germany. Yeah. I was trying to be the videographer, which I have really found out that that is definitely <laughs> not my best okay. thing to do. Um. So yeah, but we can. Yeah, we can. All we right, go. so Hunter, we're in the hurry up drill, man. So take me through the play. We, we, I was nervous, really nervous because I've had mess up snaps before sure. and we get out there, we sat down and we get down real fast, not nearly like normal because normally we'll go out there, take our time, sit it down. We were sprinting and we got down and the center, the cue for him is to go like this for me to snap it. He did this. I snapped it in my head. I thought I messed it up. And because it was hot, it was a high snap. He had to reach for it, but he still got it. And it went through the the p uh, the field goal thing, and, <laughs> and the goal post. Yeah, and I felt way better. But in my head, when I snapped it, I thought I really messed it up. It has and a really in his head out. when he says he messes up. It's it was really it, it was not, here. Like he had to go there to get it. It wasn't. Yeah, yeah. I I can visualize it. Right. Like he's making it sound like the holder yeah. had to leap and get it. He like he had to go three inches up to the right to grab it. Kicker makes the kick. We win the game. Um, that was at halftime, actually, but did you end up winning the game? That kick right there is what made us win the game Boom. because we we beat them 10 to 8. Get out and, of here. Get out of here. Sir. Sure. <laughs> and so later in the game, they scored and they got they they went for the, the uh, extra two points. They got yeah that. to try to tie. Yeah, oh to get them to eight. Yeah. yeah, yes, sir. And then we held them the rest of the game. Talking about Bernie High coming through, game winning <laughs> snap. That's awesome, man. And Dad was telling me the day we talked, we got off the phone. He said, "Hey, be praying because cuts are this afternoon. Nothing's guaranteed." Texted me two hours later, made the team. So congratulations, man. Way to keep pushing. Thank you, yes, sir. Thank you. We were nervous, but not ever nervous because of his work ethic. It's there's no. nobody that can compare. Yeah, there's no doubt about that. It's an amazing story, guys, right? You folks listening or watching us, um, just about tenacity, grit, work ethic, and a family that says early in the days, all right, we're moving on from this. We're going to do everything we can, give this young man the best quality of life. And by his sure will and determination, right, and work ethic, he keeps making it happen. You guys share one more story with me, and it's this bodybuilding story. So dad goes, you got to see these pictures of a bodybuilder. I'm like, what? What can't this kid do? Well, so dad, dad, start start the story for me. Then Hunter, just tell me, you got to tell me about this whole experience because it's wild. Hunter got obsessed with Jim a little about 18 months ago. I know. I can see. Look, he's like, he's putting a little, like a horse stepped over the back of his arm. Bigger over bicep there. than me. Thanks. He's coming for you, old man. Uh, what he said, he just, he but anyways, uh, Hey, Dad, lean back in a little bit. I'm losing you. Come back in a little bit. There you go. He wanted to either do powerlifting or bodybuilding. Okay. So I reached out to a former friend of mine that I've known for years who used to uh, 
do that. And he also worked at the INBA and talked to him. He goes, look, we've been watching your son on video because I, I put a lot of videos of him up. He goes, we think he's ready to compete. And there's a competition coming up in two weeks right two there weeks. in Dallas. I said, well, he's not going to have time to, you know, to get tan. And he goes, it's spray tan. We don't do that <laughs> in style. I'm going to oh, ask way. about that. We're going to talk more about that part of it. I told him, don't worry about it. We can do it over Zoom. We can do practice over Zoom. And then lastly was the dieting. Well, he's 15. He don't need to diet. So it didn't take much there. So long story short, I, I proposed it. He was not for it initially. He warmed up to it. We worked on his routine every night for about a week and a half. And he decided to do it. So go ahead. Well, I, at first when he told me I didn't want to do it, and then I was very on and off, on and off the first week before we left for it, and I finally decided to do it, and the first morning, when she's, the trainer that uh, did my diet for me for the two weeks, it was like a big long list on text, and I tried it one morning. And that's the most food I've ever eaten. I did not like it at all. What What did she have you eating? Boiled chicken? I mean, what are we looking at? Was, <laughs> for breakfast, this is what I ate for breakfast, and I just I could not do that. It was like four pancakes, like this big, and then a smoothie, and, and then like four, four eggs, four scrambled eggs. Well, that's one meal. She was having me eat, trying to eat five of them. So, How many calories were they trying to put in? Five thousand a day. But he was working out. In all sure. honesty, he was working sure. out twice totally. a day. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. he he was walking with me at night, three to five miles. So he was putting it in. Sure, mom. I mean, what what are we thinking here? Is this is because then no, you're already I'm you're seen. like I've seen I've seen bodybuilding pictures. I know the tan thing. I mean, what are you thinking during this whole thing? Well, my whole thing was oh my gosh I gotta make all this stuff <laughs> <laughs> that's right that's I'm like right. uh I don't think and we were going on vacation also to Savannah yeah. to see my family for a week of that and I was like I don't think this is gonna work real, real well on vacation mm. um and so after that first morning I made the pancakes and uh scrambled eggs and everything to go with it and I was like I was kind of thankful he said <laughs> I can't eat all this because it was I mean it it was a lot and it was it was based on just the calories and sure. that kind of thing but um I was relieved that I didn't have to like make all that so you're basically I mean weeks. it's basically you're cramming for two weeks to prepare for this and getting yourself ready Hunter just that that it I, I want to talk about actual event day, but just the lead up to it. What was that experience like for you? The rest of it, once you got past the initial food part of it. Um, after the initial food part and the trainer said that I didn't have to diet, I was, I decided to do it. And, um, it was fun. I mean, the, the first time posing was really, really tiring. So then after that, every day after my workout, I'd go in the bathroom and, practice my I think it was eight my eight mandatory poses and then once I started getting good at it I started not like getting out much out of breath as I was yeah it takes a and, lot out of you doesn't it yes sir I think people, and you can people tell, probably wouldn't expect that you can tell the the bodybuilders that are in I guess posing shape versus non-posing shape it mm -hmm. It does. It's the spray, the spray tan sweats off. But uh, he, I mean, he was definitely in shape for it, but he did so well with his posing that the coaches there said, there's no reason for you to do the disabled category. Let's put you in the put him up normal there. team amateur 15, and he won it. So, I mean, he did well. He was a crowd. Uh, everybody loved him. Playing up and the he, crowd. He signed a video. Yeah. He was up there just confident and loving every moment of it. Kept staring at his mom and I. And, of course, I, sh I shed a little bit of a tear because oh, I was man. so proud. Yeah, that's amazing. It's absolutely amazing. Let me have one more bit of fun with you. The spray tan thing is funny enough in and of itself, right, to have to do that. They hand you your uniform for the day. That's a little interesting, yeah. isn't it? Yes, sir. <laughs> yes, sir. <laughs> 
He stood up in front of over 500 people. I know it's an incredible. Bongy looking thing, yeah. speedos. Yeah. And um, like I said, you saw him. He was quite confident. He looked yep. like a natural. Not many have the intestinal fortitude to go that far into it. Well, he went see. back to get the spray tan, and he came out. He goes, "They made me get naked." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's what they do. <laughs> well, listen, man. To not only uh, cram for it over two weeks to go through all that, to learn, to go win your age group with all of this. I mean, it is a heck of a story of inspiration and it, you know, and it, um, we're having fun with you because it, it is, it is a fun story, but it's also pretty incredible too, man. So I know you haven't lost sight of that hunter for sure. It's amazing. Oh, what else? What happened? No, you're good. I still got you. We're good. We're rocking and rolling. I'm good. I'm good. You're good. Okay. I'm going to put no then here. I don't know All right. It, okay. There. Okay. No, we're good. Just wrap up that experience for me, dad. Right. I mean, just proud moment, huh? Oh, I was extremely proud. I was nervous at first that he would be going up on stage and freeze up on me. Sure. He didn't freeze up. He went up there and showed out and really did well, not only on his eight mandatory moves, right. but you can see that face of pure look at me. Uh, I got this and I'm proving you all wrong. Uh, and he did. I mean, it, what you didn't notice on that video was that was me tearing up. It mm. was pure joy. I could not believe sure. I was ecstatic. And, you know, like I said, ever since he was little, his mother and I have said our job in life now is to make sure we give him the best quality of life that he can attain and make sure he knows that he can do whatever the heck he wants to do. Yeah. Hunter, are we yeah. going to do some more of these or what? I want to, yes, sir. Got it. He's hooked now. Got football right now, though. Got football yeah. now, so we're focused on football. All right, before we go, uh, what's the rest of football season look like, man? Where, where uh, What are you hoping for? And uh, just tell me a little um, bit about what you're hoping for. I hope – I'm on JV right now, not varsity. So, our I hope we go undefeated because our coaches put a lot – our, our pro coaches put a lot of pressure on us this year because if we lose a game – this will be the first time JV has lost a game in three years at Bernie High School. Oof. So, Oof. Yes, sir. well, listen, I don't know if you guys know this. High school football in Texas, kind of a big deal. <laughs> <laughs> the whole town shuts down. <laughs> what, um, what's what? How many people are you guys putting in the stands there? Um, they packing, they packing them in on a Friday night. Well, it's anywhere from four to five thousand, depending on who we're playing. So yeah. it just it really does. Uh last year I you know, we were hoping to pack in more than that, but playing we played you more. I mean, listen, I, I had only so I played high school football in Northern Virginia and we were a big class A school, you know, class six A, I think. Big. Right. Yeah. It's big, right? But I'd never seen like an ISD stadium like what they have in Texas. Right? I showed Wichita Falls and they got they got like a collegiate stadium and high schools are playing there and they're packing them in. I mean, it's just, it is a special, I, I have great memories of traveling all over North Texas. And I really always love going to the smaller towns, right? Holiday, well, Texas. And we don't like pack 4,000 or more every game, but we do sure. pack a bunch. So. Yeah. That's awesome. Guys, what a great story, right? Just to, um, to hear about this family's love for their son and desire. And then this young man, I mean, you, Mom and dad, you can only take them so far, right? The rest of it's to him uh, to make Gotta good. Gotta let him go sometime. Yeah. I've yeah. learned the hard way the last year. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Every other, it'll be something else. Then it'll be another thing. And, you know, he'll be driving and all that stuff. You just got to. Oh, that's coming soon, that's too. That's coming. <laughs> that's coming. What else, guys? It's your it's your floor. What else, Colonel? Anything else we're not, I'm forgetting? Anything else you want to know about? Hunter? <laughs> no, man. I just, I love it. I'm just, I'm just so thrilled to meet you guys and make this connection and share well, your story. One, right. Share this one thing I do want to say, cause we, I kind of got cut off or I cut myself off. Um, you know, when I told you we banked his four blood. Yeah. Come back in a little bit. I lost you there. There you go. How we're going to get him, you know, fixed is what I always said. Yeah. And, um, one of my soldiers, uh, got his wife pregnant and, uh, I told him you better make your corn blood. So he did. He checked his, but he, he, he told me, he goes, you've never looked at the website, have you? And I said, no. They said, they have a young lady on there with the same left side hemiplegia as Hunter that they were using to help, not cure, but give her a better 
uh, quality of life. Quality of life. So I called and uh, basically uh, we got him on the list, got a, a cancellation call. We flew him in in less than 12 hours to go in and get his full stem cell infusion. This was at Duke University. Duke University wow. is experimental under uh, Dr. Kirksburg. Anyways, I'm going to tell you, he wasn't vocal. He couldn't speak. He couldn't walk. He scooted around with his right arm pushing himself on his rear end. Within two weeks, he said a couple words uh, post infusion. And I worked with him every night with walking wings that went around his body and just strengthened his legs. And ironically, I was going back to Iraq and for Operation New Dawn. And uh, he just stood up and Lisa at the camera, I said, film him. And uh, he stood up, said my name twice, walked right to me. I left two or three days later to go to Iraq. He's the happiest man in my life. And, and no reason I'm bringing it up is, you know, while God gets all the credit, that core blood infusion was a lot. It was a miracle. It really was. I'm going to have to give me a minute on that one. I got I got uh, dust in this studio that I'm in. <laughs> I need to clean it up a little bit. It's gotten a little. Whew, that's awesome. I'm so thrilled to meet your family. Right. Get to talk to you guys. God's good to bring us together. There's a lot For of sure. crap. There's a lot of crap on Twitter. The good stuff bubbles through. Right. And we can find yes, stories like this. Colonel, um, you're sharing a lot of this. Right. So people can kind of go along with this journey. Tell them where yes, they can sir. come. Come see this young man in action. It's, was it T, I think it's T. Glenn Moore. I'll share it in the show notes, too. But that sounds right. Please, because I think it's T. Glenn Moore uh, 423. Right. But or one, two, three. You see, we'll share it. We'll <laughs> share it. We'll share it. That way everybody can follow it and see. Uh, more family. Listen, enjoy your evening. Um, it's 645 your time. So maybe dinner time there, get some food in the young man, get him ready for the next school day and football and uh hunter man. We'll be, uh, you got a fan for life, right? Pick up the six mm-hmm. podcast fan for life. So we'll be tracking and following and just uh, see where you go next. I know this is just the beginning. Well, sir, I just want to tell you, thank you. I've, I looked at several of your podcasts. You do a phenomenal job, and it's, it's a great uh, great thing that you're doing for everybody. I appreciate it. Thank you for letting us get our story out about Hunter. He's our hero and our inspiration. That's what it's all about. You know, we've got brave men and women among us who go above and beyond through service before self, strength of purpose, and community impact. You guys check all those boxes. Those flags over my shoulder have been taken in aircraft over war-torn nations, And we take that seriously, right? And our job here is to do that, right? To elevate people like this, talk to family like yours, talk to badasses like Hunter back there and share that story. Because what the listeners are going to hear is you got something going on in your world that feels like maybe he's dragging you down, holding you back a little bit. Jump that hurdle. Keep moving on to the next one. All right. What do you say? Prove them wrong. Prove them wrong. Prove them wrong. Come and see. Come and see. Come and see what you got. Prove them wrong. I love it. That's the Moore family. It's been an absolute blast. You guys hang for a second. We'll talk here in a minute. Uh, but just an absolute uh, blast to hang out with you. And I'm grateful for the chance. That's Glenn Moore, Hunter Moore, Lisa Moore. I'm Brian Jodis. That's been this amazing episode of Pick Up the Six. 